So um, we can just go ahead and dive right in. We're going to start with a brief chat about the social justice implications of plastic production. And this is something that I'm very passionate about. And to join me, I'm pleased to introduce Kathy King, CEC's Director of Climate Education and Leadership, and Penny Owens, the Education Director at Santa Barbara Channel Keeper. They have been working on single-use plastic education and advocacy for more than a decade. And also joining us today, we are honored to have our special guest, Heidi Sanborn, the Executive Director of the National Stewardship Action Council, which is a nonprofit that she founded in 2015 to advocate for a circular economy. And we're going to get into that a little bit later and, and, and just really get into all of that um, really exciting information. So we're going to start with some basics. Uh, so uh, plastics are uh, fossil fuel products, as we know, and much of the extraction and production of these products happen near frontline communities and often in low income communities of color. And these areas are called sacrifice zones. So um, a lot of the consumer products that we have actually begin in these sacrifice zones, but I'm not sure how many people actually know this. So Kathy, can you speak to this a little bit more. Sure. Thank you, Nandra. Good afternoon and fellow panelists and everyone tuning in. Happy to be here with you today. Um, and Nadra, I really appreciate you bringing this up because I don't think that this part of the plastic issue receives enough attention. I was really encouraged last year because the Goldman Prize um, awarded a woman um, for all of North America, the, the North American Prize, to a woman named Sharon Levine who was fighting a proposed plastics manufacturing plant in her community in the southeast part of Louisiana along the Mississippi River that is also sadly known as Cancer Alley. Um, Levine's advocacy efforts um, were, she went all out for this and they really paid off when the company withdrew the permit application for that plastics plant. And I'm really grateful for her efforts. And I think she did a huge service to everyone who is trying to connect the dots between the materials we use every day and the long-term impacts on the people who live near the production and extraction of fossil fuels. Um, and I'd just like to add that sometimes banning items like straws is viewed as frivolous, but I think that we need to equate these policies with human suffering. If someone has to live in one of these sacrifice zones for us to have convenience for a beverage, um, it might be time to rethink the cost of that convenience. But we also have to be cognizant about what impacts the switching to other types of packaging might bring. Um, we know we need to get out of single use plastic, but if we switch to compostables or other types of packaging, where will those factories be cited and what are the impacts to the surrounding communities? So the big question really is how do we manage our best intentions with the impacts of our consumer habits? Um, this is where the transition to a circular economy might be most meaningful. Um, and so I'm just going to leave it there because I really want to hear what other people have to say about this. And thanks, Nadra. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Penny. And so with the many forms of pollution, uh, plastic pollution, as um, Kathy was speaking, it often ends up, not only starts, but ends up in these frontline communities. And I'm sure many of us have seen here the images of plastic pollution on the beaches of the Dominican Republic or on coastlines of the South Pacific. And a lot of the plastic waste from the US and Europe are being shipped to these countries, other countries in Africa and Asia that don't have that infrastructure to handle the imported waste. So what are some global solutions um, that are, are currently addressing some of these practices? Yeah, thanks for that, Nadra. And good afternoon, everybody. Really pleased to be here. Um, there's actually been quite a lot of activity and action towards global solutions over the past several months that are really exciting to talk about. I'm excited to share with you. Many of you may have seen back in March, the UN adopted a historic resolution for a legally binding plastic treaty that scope will cover the entire life cycle of plastic. And that's going to be a work in progress over the next few years and over 200 nations worldwide signed on to that. Um, taking a next step down, the EU is still in the process of um, implementing a circular economy mandate that they adopted back in March of 2020. And this is really exciting because it's a move away from the linear take, make, use, 
dispose type model to a circular economy. And they're also working to decouple economic, economic growth with resource use. With resource use. Um, back in June in Canada, our neighbors to the north of us here, they passed a ban on manufacturing and importation of single use plastics by the end of this year. And then um, just on July 1st, India, the second most populous country in the world, um, and um, estimates come in at about um, the country using 14 million tons of plastics annually. They passed a ban effective as of July 1st that covers a large spectrum of plastics, including items like styrene, straws, utensils, and single-use plastic bags. This will come in in a phased-in approach, but has some significant impact to really reduce plastics in a growing country where there's significant, significant use. A little bit closer to home, we have some interesting things happening here. Um, in California this past spring, the Attorney General, Ram Bonta, launched a formal investigation focusing on fossil fuel and petrochemical industries and their role in misleading the public about plastic recycling, as well as the impacts of plastic to our residents, to the health of our communities, and on our natural resources here in California. And then there was an exciting settlement agreement that occurred back in um, Louisiana. Kathy was mentioning Cancer Alley. So this is an 85 mile corridor along the Mississippi River that has the highest concentration of petrochemical and fossil fuel companies in the country. And unfortunately, it also has the highest cancer rates as a result of these air pollutants, these hazardous air pollutants. And earlier in June, a settlement was reached between the Environmental Protection Agency and two of the parishes in Louisiana. And as a result of this settlement, it will lead to the review of air pollution standards and also to new rules governing emissions um, for these petrochemical plants in that region. So hopefully protecting those communities that are at risk. And back to you, Nadra. You're muted, Nadra. Oh, now I'm not muted. <laughs> you would think after all this time, but it still happens to the best of us. Um, but I was just going to to add um, in uh, Ron Bonta's uh, statement about his investigation. He actually mentioned that um, we consume a credit card's worth of plastic every week. And so I thought that that was just very, um, very insightful that he put that and made that statement as a part of his, um, you know, investigation. So we're going to move on to um, our special guest, Heidi Samburn. And thank you so much for, again, for being here with us today and sharing all the amazing and exciting work that you're doing. And with your organization, your tagline is stand up for the environment and social justice. And so how does plastic fit into that and fit into your work? Thank you, Nadra, I'm so glad to be here. Um, so our, yeah, our tagline is advocating for a circular and equitable economy. And the last thing we wanna do is make things worse for the people who have already taken the brunt of just poor siting, quite frankly, of facilities. Now, I mean, I've always said, we don't put landfills and, and burn uh, plants next to rich neighborhoods. That's never happened. Um, and there's a reason for it. They don't want them there. Um, and that's not fair to everybody else who, and I'm so glad we're talking about Cancer Alley. My dad's a, a postdoc in chemistry and he's been talking about Cancer Alley for 50 years and how concerning it was that all these chemical plants were put in this very low income area where people actually used to live off the land you know, mm. and they can't anymore because their mm. land is poisoned and their water is poisoned. And I'm just so glad we're finally um, really putting a lens on environmental justice. And I said, um, talk about this a little bit. You know, I chaired the Recycling Commission for the last two years. I just resigned as of July 1st and I'll explain why, but the, um, you know, we, a lot of the work that you just referenced came from the discussions we had at the commission and that letter that we sent to to the AG. Um, so we understand environmental injustice. We were trying to right the ship on a whole bunch of stuff. But what I say is our system in waste management is so messed up. There are so many layers of problems. It's like an onion. And once you peel back one, you finish that, you get to the next and you get to the next and you get to the next. 
and you do as many as you can at a time, but you can't do them all at once. <laughs> it's just too big. So um, that's why I was really excited to get 54 done because that is the very biggest thing that's ever happened in our industry in the country, let alone California. So hopefully that's a good start. Do you want me to just get into the PowerPoints? Um, you know, we're going to um, circle back to um, Kathy and then we'll, and then we can get into the um, PowerPoint presentation, but that's really exciting. We're to get into the discussion about SB 54 and then also seeing how other states have started to that course with um, Maine and Oregon and Washington and some of the um, the work that they've done with extended producer responsibility laws. So it'll be interesting to see like how, when we get into that discussion, how their work has informed um, SB 54 and um, what's coming up for California. So thank you. And I should say also the commission um, did talk about, we actually discussed um, the Basel Action Network uh, had uh, did, gave us a presentation and we asked the state to pass a law to stop the export of plastics to countries that could not handle it and also asked the Biden administration to re, you know, sign the Basel Convention. We have never signed it and been a party to that convention. Um, those things, we sent the, the government sent the letter and we passed a bill, AB 881 last year, that does do that for us here because I've said it's uh, environmental, it's international environmental injustice. When a rich country like ours and California is the largest exporter of plastic is literally imposing all of our waste on communities that simply cannot manage it. And we know that, and that's not fair. So mm -hmm. those are also things that have been happening that I think uh, align with this discussion. Awesome, thank you so much, Heidi. Um, so we're going to circle back to Kathy um, King, and Kathy has been with uh, CEC since 2008, and she served as the festival director for Earth Day and has been the instructor for CEC's UC Climate Stewards course. Um, climate stewards course. Uh, I don't know if I said that is clear the first time. She also leads the CEC's waste reduction pro program, whose work includes plastic policy advocacy, rethink the drink hydration station program, and community education. Um, and so go ahead and take it away, Kathy. Thanks, Nadra. Hello again. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes here to set up the problem. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Thanks, Olivia. Um, you may recall this study from Australia in 2019, and I think that um, it was referenced um, by Nadra a few minutes ago in terms of what the Attorney General um, talked about when he st started his plastics investigation. Um, and it, that study revealed that we are ingesting humans, we being humans, about a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Um, it's not yet known what impacts this will have on our overall health, but there are new studies out there suggesting that plastic in our gut is um, having um, an impact on people who have issues with inflammation. Uh, next slide, please. You may also remember this study from the fall of 2020 in which air quality was sampled in seven national parks in the US. The study found microplastic in every park, even in the most remote areas, and scientists determined that it's the equivalent of 120 to 300 million plastic bottles raining down on these wide open spaces every year. Microplastic has also been found on Mount Everest and on plants in the Arctic. Next slide, please. A more recent study just from March of this year uh, found that there is um, microplastics in living human lung tissue. And this was the first time that that was discovered. Um, and this suggests that we are breathing in microplastics from the air around us. And when you think about it, it makes sense that plastic is present in urban areas. When you think about all the plastic that has been found in these remote areas and studies in urban areas have shown that this is true. Uh, next slide, please. Can we recycle our way out of the plastic crisis? <laughs> Let's pause for a poll so you can weigh in um, if you want to launch the poll now. Um, according to a recent report, Beyond Plastic, um, how much plastic was recycled in the US 
in 2021. So go ahead and make your choice there. And while you were doing that, I will tell you that this report came from the organization Beyond Plastic, headed up by Judith Inc. Judith was also an EPA administrator during the Obama administration. And here's a quote from Judith um, who says, plastic recycling does not work, never will work, and no amount of false advertising will change that. So pretty blunt <laughs> statement there from Judith Inc. So um, has everybody had a chance to weigh in? And we will bring up the results in a moment and let you know, oh, look, you all, most of you got it right. If you chose 5%, then you got it right. If you chose 10%, which a lot of other people did, then you were right previous to last year. So in 2021, um, the rate went down to 5%, which is really dismal. But the previous rate for many years before that was 9%, which also is not great. Um, and it really shows that plastic does not fit into the true recycling model. There's too many different types, it melts at different temperatures, and you can't make it back into the same thing, which is the very definition of recycling. So here's something that you can do. Please don't wish cycle. Items that you put into the blue bin that aren't currently accepted, take time to remove from the conveyor belt by people at the recycling facility. This costs the facilities time and money. Marburg, the waste management company for most of Santa Barbara County, has a handy tool on their website that lets you click on a type of plastic and the graphic turns over to tell you whether it's currently recyclable. Um, we'll put a link to that page in the chat and in our follow-up email if you want to check it out. And if Marburg isn't your waste hauler, then chances are yours has something similar on their website. So it's worth, you know, being aware of what type of plastic can go into your blue bin. This does change um, regularly, and it's important to do it right. Um, and also, please remember that items that you put in your blue bin should be empty, clean, dry, empty, clean, and dry and unbagged. There's, it's not necessary to bag the items. And when you bag it, it has a tendency to hold moisture. And if paper that is generally the most valuable item in your blue bin gets wet, then it loses its value. Um, and a lot of times people say, well, should I be using water to clean these things out? You don't have to scrub things clean. Um, just make sure that it's not leaking um, food or other you know, substances or water when you put it into the blue bin. You don't have to make sure it's squeaky clean. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to you, Nadra. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very informative. And um, now I am going to turn it over to Penny Owens. Penny Owens um, is the Education and Community Outreach Director at the Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, where she has been there since 2004. Um, she leads the Channel Keeper's education programs, uh, spending time with students in creeks and classrooms, and she also manages their Marine Protected Area Watch Program and their Single-Use Plastic Reduction uh, Initiative. So my question to you, Penny, is how can individuals get involved in plastic reduction efforts? All righty, thanks, Nadra. Well, first off, we wanted to kick this off with a little poll. So we are part of our inspiration for hosting this event is celebrating Plastic Free, Free July, a global initiative to look at ways to reduce single-use plastic. And so we wanna launch our second poll question here. Olivia, please. And it is, how many people have participated in Plastic Free July since 2011? 5 million, 35 million, 50 million, or 140 million? So folks, go ahead and um, take, a, take a stab at that. And I just want to say that this, this um, global campaign was actually started by one person, a woman in Australia, from her home back in 2011. And this year's theme for Plastic Free July is turn the tide one choice at a time. But the overall theme for Plastic Free July is really looking at um, refusing those single use plastics. And really we're gonna bump it up to the five R's. So our refuse, reduce, repurpose, reuse, and then recycle. So let's go ahead and close that poll and see what folks thought for how many participants. And we really wanted to use this as an example to show how we can start small and grow and have a global 
um, <laughs> my coworker's dog really wants to join the webinar right now, but we can have a global presence. <laughs> and it's actually 140 million people have participated since it started in over 190 countries. So what started as one person has grown into this global effort. So we can go ahead and close that. And um, just a little bit more about Plastic Free July. So it's really encouraging folks to take individual action, but then also to learn about how we can be part of making larger system changes and supporting policies and legislations, not just at the state level, at the federal level, and even at the global level. And so we, oh, oh yeah, we can move to the next slide, please. I have a cute little um, logo next slide again. Sorry, I forgot all about the slides. So here's the website to Plastic Free July. There's some great resources there that you can look to for inspiration. And we really encourage folks to be creative, to think of ways that they can um, identify single-use plastics and then creatively find ways that they don't need to use that anymore. Um, obviously, it's really difficult to get to 100% reduction. But these small changes do add up. And, um, I'd also like to encourage folks to check out, you can sign the Plastic Free July Pledge on CEC's website. And I think they'll be providing that link to you. And really it's, you just try to do the best you can. And um, Kathy, this is an example she always uses and I really like it. If you're at the grocery store and you're looking at your cart and you see some of that single use plastic, um, how do you maybe think about grabbing one or two of those items and replacing them with something else? Or my personal case, how do I commit to making my own hummus from scratch so that I don't need to buy that hummus? Um, and then just remember that those small changes add up. And um, another one is um, just there's really a lot more options available now for bars and tablets for cleaning products and personal care products. And in fact, one of my friends just texted me and said she was able to find some um, reusable, refillable dishwashing soap at Target. So these, these types of refillable and reusable um, products are becoming more and more available. Next slide, please. Uh, I always like to make a plug for some more uh, individual action that has a larger impact for Coastal Cleanup Day. It's coming up here on the third Saturday of September. You can pretty much head to any beach um, in California, but if you can't make it to a beach, we also encourage you to look around your neighborhood, your community, your parks, and just leave it a little cleaner than you found it. Um, Coastal Cleanup Day here in California is from nine to noon. And at Channel Keeper, we're gonna be down at West Beach with our wonderful community volunteers. And that lower picture there is just an example of some of the trash that we continue to find. I was actually just out with a group earlier this week and we're still finding some of that compressed polystyrene, the foam, plenty of plastic bottle caps, lids, uh, plastic cutlery utensils, a lot of those single use plastic items that we're um, hopefully gonna hear a little bit more about how we can start shifting to, away from using those. Next slide, please. So as Kathy was mentioning, you know, we're finding microplastics everywhere we look for it. And Channel Keeper comes to this single use plastic issue from the viewpoint of their impact on our waterways. And here in coastal California, our waterways, our creeks and our rivers drain to the ocean. So not only is that single use plastic, those microplastics having an impact in our rivers and our creeks, our beaches, but also the ocean. And so there was a new study I wanted to highlight this recently studied um, published that was published that speaks really to the extent of the global plastic pollution in remote regions. And that was they found microplastics in freshly um, fresh Antarctic snow. And so they took um, 19 different samples around the Ross ice, Ross ice shelf and they processed those for the uh, microplastics. They found that the most common particles were a type of plastic called polyethylene terephthalate, which is PET. And that's the plastics that's found in our clothes and water bottles. And they actually found that it was in higher concentrations in that fresh snow than um, it actually was in the surrounding marine environment and from samples they've looked at in ice cores. And so there's some concern that these microplastics in the snow could contribute to accelerated um, snow and ice melting. And the top photo there is illustrating some of our microplastics. And I just wanted to highlight a really great partnership and research that's happening right here in our own backyard in the Santa Barbara area. University of California, Santa Barbara and the city of Santa Barbara Creeks Division are partnering and they're looking at microplastics in our stormwater, stormwater samples. And so they've been conducting samples last year and I think the year before that, they um, started in 2020 and 2021. And um, they're hoping to 
to determine the level of microplastics in our stormwater. And then they're gonna do some further research to identify if there's um, some of the mitigation measures like street sweeping and the screens and um, other mitigation measures to reduce plastic in the environment has an impact. So next slide, please. So CEC and um, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper have been working together since 2009 to advocate for single-use plastic reduction policies. And together, uh, we've successfully lobbied for uh, seven regional laws that um, ban items like single-use plastic grocery bags, EPS, um, expanded polystyrene foam to go wear, straws. And we've also worked to support legislation at the statewide level. And, and federal policies as well. And we're really excited to hear more from our guest here in a minute about some of the action at the statewide level. Next slide, please. And with that, Nadra, I will hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Um, it's great to see all of the effort and support that um, that we have around um, Plastic Free July. Um, and we have a lot of work ahead of us as well. So <laughs> it's good to know what we're what we're up against and, and the support that we have to do it. So next, I'm going to transition over to um, Heidi Samborn, who is the executive director of the National Stewardship Action Council. Um, it's a nonprofit that she founded in 2015 to advocate for the circular economy. Heidi was previously a founding director of the highly successful California Product Stewardship Council. And prior to that, she was an advisor to the chair of the California Waste Management Agency, now called Cal Recycle. Heidi has been a leader in the California solid waste industry for over 30 years. She's an internationally recognized thought leader and advocate for producer responsibility who has spoken around the world. Heidi has frequently published and interviewed on national public radio and CBS Nightly News, quoted in the Time Magazine, The Guardian, and The Wall Street Journal. In 2020, Heidi was appointed by the California EPA to the Statewide Commission on Recycling Markets and Curbside Recycling and was elected the Commissioner Chair. She serves on several advisory councils, including the Advisory Board for the Solid Waste, Association of North America representing materials recovery. So it's so wonderful to have you here today. Um, I, you just have such a breadth of experience and knowledge. We are honored to be able to have you speak with us and share some of your insights. So let's start off. I know we were kind of getting into a little bit of um, a little sprinkling about SB 54, but um, can you really speak to this um, landmark legis le legislation um, that addresses plastic pollution in California? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me, and thanks to all of you out there who care about these issues that I've spent my entire career working on, 32 years uh, plus now, um, and now everybody's speaking the language I've been speaking and talking trash for the last 32 years, which is we've got to do better at source reduction, making sure everything can be recyclable and compostable, get toxics out of the system, and truly get to a circular economy. And now we're at a place where we're actually passing legislation that does all those things. Um, so I have a PowerPoint, which I thought might be helpful because I've actually pulled language. I shouldn't say me. My staff, Jordan, did a great job pulling this together for me. Um, and we've actually pulled out language from the bill so you can see for yourself what the words on the page say. Um, so if you'd like me to, I can just go ahead and start through the PowerPoint. Would that be helpful? Yes, yes, if you wanna go ahead and start. Oh, okay, because um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been working on this for so long. This is like the pinnacle of my career, it feels like this bill and there's a lot to it. And so I think it's important since we've only got an hour well, I just want to get into it so you can definitely see Thank what you. this is. So um, the Plastic Pollution Prevention Packaging Producer Responsibility Act. That means it's, it's really two things. We focused in this bill on um, reducing plastic pollution while dealing with all of packaging as uh, an entity. So when I first started working on producer responsibility, um, I studied around the world. I would go to different conferences. I went to the packaging conference in Belgium and Brussels in 2010 and again later um, and learned that other countries already were doing this very, very effectively. And I could not understand why the companies in our country 
which were selling into their countries, were so vehemently opposed and had absolutely no idea what these policies were um, that were making them pay for the end of life costs of their products. And I became a fierce advocate for it when I realized that what we were being told here was horse pucky and what they were doing there, we needed to get here in order to fund a system and get true source reduction where the producers can't externalize the costs onto the environment and onto government and everyone else while they, you know, take all the profit, but they make all the design and marketing decisions that decide, will it be compostable and recyclable or a pollutant and highly littered? That's what, those are their decisions. And if we don't give them a financial feedback mechanism in order for them to care, they won't. Um, so this is, this to me is the big kahuna of bills in the waste management industry. It's, I've always said packaging EPR will be the hardest thing we ever do, and it was. But the good news is because of all the work of the advocates that got the ballot measure on, that was the backdrop. And that actually forced the industry to the table. And they had to negotiate because no matter which way they went, they were going to spend a hundred million, five billion, whatever. They were going to spend a lot of money. And so that really did help keep them at the table for this negotiation. Um, so I will just go through quickly our, who we are. So I had formed this, um, after I worked in the chair's office at the waste board, I realized how much money was in garbage. For most people, you don't know this, but for every county, top three is police and fire, public health and garbage. It's almost always number three is our expense. It's a huge amount of money. The lobbying that goes on from the waste haulers for contracts, for you know, all the, the money in the system is huge. And I could see how it was affecting the policy. So I decided I was gonna have to go out and start educating and advocating for um, producers to be responsible for what they put on the market. That was not a popular idea at the time. I was told, and I will tell you this truthfully, even by fellow advocates that we would never get that here in the United States. We do not have parliamentary government, it won't work. Um, but I refuse to believe it. You just have to keep pounding at it to get it. And I'm very, <laughs> I get uh, what I call lockjaw once I decide we should do something. So um, I formed a, a California Product Stewardship Council, which was a C3. We got uh, bills passed on mercury thermostat, produce responsibility, then carpet and paint. Paint's working really well. Mattresses started coming along. Then I got the big one we thought, which was pharmaceuticals and needles. But this was even bigger because it was a two thirds vote to get it off the, of the ballot and we had to get that much agreement and bipartisanship. So um, I formed the C4 so that I could advocate for a circular economy and do these bills all over the country because I could see where California was incubating. We needed to share that information with other states and with the nation. So I speak all over the country on this issue and actually the world. Um, so we also started the C3, the Stewardship Action Foundation, which we're working on um, educating around all the issues we're doing on the advocacy on the C4 side. So if you're interested in helping, this was a very expensive bill. And I can tell you, I wiped out pretty much every reserve we had and I could use your help there. Um, so our board, we've tried to be very sensitive to diversity and we have um, put, actually put a call out for different people um, from different uh, parts of the country and different you know, men, women, the whole thing, BIPOC, and we're very proud of our board and members. They care very much about this issue. And I wanna say that the circular economy definition, I just wanna say, um, we follow the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I've heard from some advocates, they really don't like Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They have lots of problems with them. Okay, that's fine. I think the definition is good and solid. First, we design waste and pollution out of the system. Second, we keep products and materials in motion and use that's recycling and composting. And then three, we regenerate what we've messed up in natural systems. This bill does all three. I've never seen a bill do all three. If you would have asked me two years ago if we could have done this bill, I would have said no. The only reason we got it again was the ballot measure being the backdrop and the threat. So, um, and of course the goal that was mentioned earlier is to decouple growth and economic activity from growth and garbage. You want, that shouldn't be a parallel. <laughs> Otherwise, we're just consuming resources and we'll never 
uh, we'll get, we'll deplete them. So I got onto the Recycling Commission here in California and was elected chair by the commissioners. And I'm gonna just highlight this very, very quickly. The commission was really, really effective for the two years I was chair. We had a really good commission that worked really, really hard, came up with really good ideas. We had 34 policies that we recommended to the state. And um, if you're curious what they are, this is the hot link, it's on the Cal Recycle website. The reason I'm bringing this up is it directly has led to 54 in many ways. Um, and some of the bills that have led to 54, such as SB 343 from last year, you might recall that was a big bill about truth in labeling. You can't use a chasing arrow anymore by 2025 if it's truly not meeting the definition of recyclability, which is 60% going to actual markets. That was a big deal. It was very hard fought and the commission actually came up with this recommendation. And then uh, Californians Against Waste and I co-sponsored the bill with Senator Allen to get it passed. It made national news and it should have because, you know, it literally will make it a crime for companies to use the chasing arrow symbol on any product or package that hasn't met the state's criteria. Now, it also says that we cannot include toxic chemicals in the materials and call it recyclable because I don't want toxic spinning around in the system. That's not a circular economy. You design waste and pollution out first. So I'm very proud that we got that as setting the table for this bill. Um, I can also say that um, we're looking at doing this bill nationally. I've actually worked with Maryland. They've already introduced it. They're gonna try it again this next year, but this is changing the game on what producers know they will have to do. The reason I work in California is with 12% of the US market. What we do matters. And they will usually not have different products for other states. If California goes, truly so goes the nation. They don't make two types of packages for different states uh, normally. So. And they know usually as we go, everybody else is following them. So this gets us to SB 54. Um, this bill, they started it back in 2018. Um, I was not super active in the early years with this bill and I'll tell you why. Not that I don't believe in it. It was just that it didn't feel like we had the right people at the table and the bill wasn't as strong as I would have liked it to be. But I, you know, we kind of quietly watched the process and we supported it, of course, but we weren't like super active in it. And I was getting really concerned because the longer you have failures in the legislature, the less the legislature wants to take it up. And so I really decided um, it was very important that we start, you know, getting more engaged and helping them figure this out. The ballot measure again was a very big component that qualified for the ballot for this year. Um, it was supposed to be heard actually, I think um, two years ago and then there was a delay with COVID, um, but it ended up all working out. But that was a very general bill. It gave a lot of authority to Cal Recycle, too much uh, probably in my opinion. Um, and there was no recycling rates or dates in it, um, but there was a lot of good stuff, right? So, you know, it would, but it was basically what could have been in the media used as a tax because they were gonna charge one cent per single use plastic item sold into the market would have to be paid by the producer. So that was very motivating, of course. Um, Heidi, can I, yep. can I I'm stop really quickly because sure. can we just um, go back a little bit and can you um, explain that SB 54 bill because everyone who, here is oh, not I'm gonna get through that yeah okay okay Sorry, you're it's going... really big okay so set the stage yeah and then um, jump into it okay awesome we're we're leading so, up to it got it all right yeah so here we are so 54 <laughs> so the negotiations when I got involved with Senator Allen I said look you know we've really got to get broader group of stakeholders um the waste haulers and others are going to have to play a big role in the system for it to work and so they ended up you know, setting the table with 25 stakeholders, basically, that were industry, NGOs, haulers, and local governments. And I was at the table from the NGO side with uh, Oceana, Nature Conservancy, and um, Monterey Bay Aquarium and Ocean Conservancy. The rest were of the other groups. And we had weekly meetings, multiple meetings since January, but we started really in October 
numerous drafts of this bill, technical assistance was given by CalRecycle, numerous conversations with the administration. And, um, you know, we were trying to individually talk to other stakeholders, EJ groups and others to get feedback. Um, this is the group, by the way, at the celebration event that night. Um, many of us, Senator Allen is there to the right, the tallest person there. <laughs> um, now, key features. I call this bill producer responsibility version 3.0 plus, and I'll explain why. This EPR packaging bill, if you know, we've had or we had Maine, then Oregon, and then Colorado go. I think this one by far is the best. Why do I think that? Because we did a lot of things here based on lessons learned elsewhere. Um, we, it's multiple materials. It's not just plastic. You cannot collect just one type of packaging. It doesn't work that way. The system is set up to, do, to collect all packaging. So it had to be multiple material, which made it complicated, um, but that's normal around the world. It says that you have to have all materials as recyclable and compostable by 2032, no later than. 25% of plastics must be source reduced by weight and unit by 2032. That is not to be taken lightly. Weight is light weighting. Unit is number of things. They have to hit both. That is very difficult. That is not easy. And I'm actually quite surprised we were able to get it. Um, and that's the first time I've seen it. 10% has to be done by 2027. And again, January of these years. 2% by reuse and refill by then. 20% by 2030 with 4% reuse and refill, and then an evaluation every um, five years thereafter. The recycling rates are that they cannot be less than 30% by 2028, 40% by 2030, and 65% by 2032. So it also says that there's a needs assessment, and this will be done by CalRecycle every five years or so. That's gonna determine what the needs are for the system, what's out there, what's being sold, what's a contaminant, what isn't, and what's really hitting these recycling rates. It's going to uh, set a table for an advisory board that will be selected by CalRecycle that will advise the producer run program on how to run and what they should do so that we have connection with the existing infrastructure. We protected, this was a big one for me. We brought Republic and Waste Management uh, to the table, along with municipal uh, representatives that, that haul for themselves. And they really wanted the PRO, the Producer Responsibility Organization, to not get into their business. They said, we've developed millions of dollars of infrastructure. We don't want them getting in the middle of our contracts between us and cities, but we want them to be additive. If they want us to collect more widgets, more plastic, X, at a, and have it be cleaner, then they need to give us the money to invest in the, in the machinery or the labor to do it. And that's how we wrote the bill. So the haulers will literally, and the cities will negotiate directly with the PRO. If the PRO wants them to do better, collect more things, then they have to work something out and they're gonna have to help pay for it. But that shouldn't be on the taxpayers and the ratepayers anymore. It's very robust, this version of the bill, much better than previous versions on transparency. There is a lot, a lot required of this producer-run organization. It must be a nonprofit under the 501c3 rules, which is out of the, I think, 17 or 18 different types of nonprofits, the one that they call has the halo effect. It's the most transparent and the most um, enforceable by the AG. So that's important, but there's many, many more steps in there. And CalRecycle has a ton of ability to pull levers and um, push them to be transparent, including annual reports with a lot of data required. Um, they have to submit plans every five years, no less, the producer run group. Um, and they have to have one producer run group for the first seven years. But after that, they could maybe start splitting off. So if one group says, hey, my type of packaging is less costly than all the rest, we don't wanna be forced into this bigger group. We're gonna go over here, we can do it ourselves. They'd have to get it approved by CalRecycle, but they could do that after seven years. And again, there's the annual reporting by the PRO to the state. Now, the plus part, 
of the 3.0 plus is that we actually got mitigation for environmental damage. The polluters are going to pay $5 billion over 10 years. I wanted it to start earlier, but CalRecycle said they cannot get the rules in place and faster. So they asked for 2027, um, but that's the way it is. But we got 5 billion that will go 60% to environmental justice um, and public health or communities that have um, traditionally been impacted, highly impacted rural and rural communities um, for their public health um, efforts as well to, for all this pollution. Um, then 40% will go to state agencies. They're all outlined in the bill um, to go clean up, for example, the you know, parks and recs. Um, there's a whole bunch of them, the ocean, et cetera. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the producers agreeing to pay $5 billion to a state to clean up the pollution from their product. This is the first. And again, I don't think we would have gotten it had it not been for the ballot measure as a backdrop. So a few other issues um, on environmental justice. Two of the 13 voting members of the PRO advisory board have to represent environmental justice in disadvantaged communities. It acknowledges the disproportionate impacts of plastic pollution on these communities. We've said that right in the bill. Provides clear definitions for what disadvantaged low-income community and rural is. It clarifies within the definition of recycling that in exploring approaches for technologies that disadvantaged or low-income communities cannot be disproportionately impacted by human health or other environmental impacts. In determining the producer fees for the producer-run organization, the cost should be accounted for to ensure harm to disadvantaged or low-income communities are avoided and minimized. So again, how the producers fund facilities to comply with the program cannot be, uh, harm these communities. And CalRecycle could prohibit them from, from funding those, those um, facilities. In developing the regulations and considering the activities conducted uh, with the regulations, CalRecycle must avoid disproportionate impacts, again, to disadvantaged low income. So again, you can see over and over, we, this is the theme throughout the entire bill. And then CalRecycle will consider the impacts to disadvantaged communities in rural areas when setting penalties. It's pretty robust. Um, conversion technologies. Now this is one of the, so these are two of the areas that ended up surprising to me to be the controversy um, from some of the environmental groups that didn't support the bill or even oppose the bill. Um, I thought we pretty much got the environmental justice stuff handled. I know that uh, Shiana was working very closely. I think, I think they were with Azul and some others um, to make sure that we were protective of those um, communities. There was one, one gal that was never thought it was good enough. I kept saying, you know, what is it more that we could do? I, I don't know if somebody's got ideas, please let us know. Um, but this is another area was the conversion technologies. And people worried that the new, you know, black box uh, solution that the plastics industry is selling is what they're, I've heard called multiple names, chemical recycling, molecular recycling, advanced recycling. They just keep throwing mud at the wall until somebody thinks it's a good idea. I said, as the chair of the commission, we are not going to hear these because to me, they do not meet the definition of recycling. If the state changes that, then we can talk about those technologies, but until such time you provide us with the feedstock input, the emissions, and the product, we cannot tell you if this is meeting the definition of recycling and we should be talking about it as a commission, with a recycling commission, <laughs> not the disposal commission. So um, we never did get any one of those companies to give us that level of detail, so we never took it up. Um, we did take up one policy that was presented by two of the commissioners that was quickly beat down by I think 320 different comments from the public that were very upset that uh, anything was happening here. But I, I just wanna be clear as my dad is a PhD chemist um, that you, you know, defining uh, being upset with a technology because it uses heat or whatever, I don't know if that's the right metric. Maybe it's like the, again, the feedstock, the outcome and any emissions. Um, some things like, um, anaerobic digestion used for organics produce 
methane very naturally. That's what nature does if it goes anaerobic. So, I mean, there are different levels of these things. So anyway, these are, but this is what it says in the bill. To prevent these new tech black box technologies from being counted as recycling. The definition in the bill says it does not include any of the following, combustion, incineration, energy generation, fuel production, except for anaerobic digestion, and that's why, that's basically a natural process being expedited in a machine, or other forms of disposal. And cow recycle is required to develop regulations that exclude plastic recycling technologies that generate specific amounts of hazardous waste. This definition is intended to exclude technologies such as gasification, pyrolysis, and solvent-based technologies. And the bill also authorizes CalRecycle to adopt regulations to verify the requirements to ensure that a covered material is shipped out of state or exported is done in a manner so they can't ship out of state and try and get away from these requirements. It would still, under the rubric of this bill, be covered. Now, I still have heard, and I know you mentioned Judith Think earlier, she and I normally agree, we do not agree on this. Um, I said, I think that's enough. And we gave CalRecycle a lot of tools to prevent these facilities from getting funding from the program, to prevent things from being shipped out of state, um, et cetera. And so um, this is just one of those areas and I can see screens going on, so I, I better move quicker. Um, polystyrene, the de facto ban. It, you cannot sell it, um, polystyrene anymore in California unless it hits 25% recycling rate by 2025. And I guarantee you that won't happen. And there's no preemption of the bill. Um, so you can still do local bans if you would like. Um, violations, if they fail, that's $50,000 a day fines. That was very important to me. But the one I really worked hard for was you can actually revoke the PRO. You can actually have CalRecycle say, you're done, you're not doing what we expected you to do. It's a bad program. We're gonna revoke you. We're gonna take the money and redistribute it to the, the groups that you were paying. And we're gonna go out for um, an RFP to get another producer run organization to run this program. That's never happened before anywhere in the world that I know of. And I fought very hard for it to make sure we get this program. So I know I have to move uh, quicker. Like I said, this is a very big bill. I could talk about this for easily hours. Um, but we lobbied day and night to get this bill done. You can see me there with Senator Allen and some of the haulers and some others. Um, there was a lot of women that worked on this bill. I wanna thank all my, there's so many women that worked on this bill. In fact, that bottom picture, is a lot of them there. I wanna thank them all. And so next steps, we're gonna have a cleanup bill. Regulations are gonna start, implementation is gonna start. And there's a whole timeline here I can share and I'll share the PowerPoints, but um yeah there's probably not enough time to go over this bill yeah um, yeah unfortunately we're at a minute until the yeah. end so we have to wrap up next time we're gonna have to have you back if you're willing to come back I'd <laughs> because, love to come back yeah it's so much it's so much great information and I wish that we could dig in a little bit more but we want to just make sure that we end on time but thank you so much Heidi for all of this information uh just it's it's so great to um see all the work that has been done all the work that you've put in and I just want to thank you for your lockjaw dedication <laughs> to this and <laughs> the 30 years of you know the first probably I don't know 20 25 of people like just thinking that you were talking you know craziness um but just sticking yeah. to your gun so really appreciate that and hopefully we can have you back um i just want to give a quick thank you to um all our panelists um uh again uh, heidi is on board thank you so much kathy penny um we want to thank our fabulous staff olivia and kathy alfredo from uh strauss uh, technologies and then we also want to thank our sponsors as well um we want to thank um 
Bye Bye Mattress, uh, Toad & Co, and Marburg. And there's also going to be a follow-up email on the next few days of a recording of this webinar and other resources and free events just like this one um, we will continue to do. And like I said, hopefully we can have Heidi back again to continue. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to answer all the questions. I know there was a lot of information that was going around and we were doing our best to get those uh, questions answered. Um, so if you're interested in advocating for a climate uh, smart policy, with your elected officials, fill out the brief survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. And, you know, we appreciate all of your feedback. And CEC is one of the five nonprofits in Santa Barbara County to hold the highest rating of uh, for nonprofits and Charity Navigator and GuideStar. Um, just a little highlight about CEC and all the great work we do in Secret Bright. Um, our CEO was named the Congressional Woman of the Year by Congressman Salud. Uh, Carver Hall in recognition of her 25 years of trailblazing leadership and uh, climate action and environmental stewardship. So you can give your support to CEC's critical work on cecsb.org slash give. Thank you so much for joining and we look forward to connecting with you all soon. Thank you again.